I really am. I'm just as excited today as I ever have been about God and what He's doing in my life and what He's doing in the lives of the people that are around me. And I believe what He's going to do in this community. I believe with all my heart that this is a special church. And um, I believed it uh, since day one. When I, and that was reinforced. I've said this before. I'll say it again. It was reinforced big time uh, when uh, back in 2010, uh, God dropped a little expression into uh, one person in this church. And it was for that billboard that we put up. And, and because of that billboard that we put up, this church was able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with over 250 million people worldwide. Now, that's a, that's a crazy number when you're sitting in a room with you know, 50 people in it. But, but I believe that was a, a foreshadowing of what is to come. I think with all my heart that, that God wants to use this church to do things like that, of that magnitude. And it's going to take more than one crazy guy to do that. I, I need your partnership. And so uh, be open to what the Spirit of God would, would uh, move upon you and tell you what to do. And then I beg you and plead with you, do it. Amen? Um, I want you to grab your Bibles, and tonight we're going to finish up our study through the book of Ephesians, I believe, unless God says otherwise this coming week, uh, but I think this may be it. Uh, but open up your Bibles to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. I want to let you know, <clears throat> as you're turning there, that um, my plan is to start next week, again, unless the Holy Spirit says something otherwise, but my plan, uh, through much prayer and study is to explore the Gospel of Luke. And that will probably take a year. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, the Bible, I, I love the Bible. It's, it talks about how Jesus, when He's lifted up, like if we lift up Jesus and put Him up here for everybody to see, that if we just do that part, His part is He starts, He's like a tractor beam. Anyone, any sci-fi uh, uh, people here, right? You know what a tractor beam is? You know, when the big mothership comes around and there's nothing that you could do about it because it starts sucking you in and you're like, I can't, I got lost control. I'm, I'm getting sucked in. That's what Jesus promises to do. It will lift him up. And so the, the gospel of Luke does just that. It, it just goes a one thing after another about Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I'm all about the business of building Jesus Christ Church. And the best way to do it is to lift up Jesus so that the world can know who He is. And that's what I want to do with the Gospel of Luke, if the Lord allows next week. So, that's the plan. So if you'd like to start reading through the Gospel of Luke, I would recommend it. I think that way you'll know what in the world I'm talking about when we get there. But in the meantime, we're going to jump back into the book of Ephesians. Not to be outdone. Great book. All the Word of God is inspired. It's from God. It's always, and all, it's all good for teaching, right? So how many people here tonight want God to teach them something? Raise your hand. Let them see that you want something from Him. All right, perfect. That's 100% right there. I like that. Okay, so I want to remind you that, once again, that the book of Ephesians was a book of encouragement. It was not a book like other books of the Bible where people were misbehaving like crazy and God was like hammering them through Paul to get in line, get, get back online because you're messing up. It wasn't like that. The book of Ephesians was written to a, a group of followers that were actually doing pretty well. And he wanted to encourage them to do even better, to be more effective where they were so the gospel could advance. And that's what this church that you're sitting in is all about. That's the sole intention of this church is to, is to move the gospel from right here out there so everyone to the ends of the earth, say that with me, the ends of the earth would hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what the church is all about. Every church, that should be the mission statement of every church. It's the mission of ours. So Paul goes to Ephesus under the inspiration of the Spirit and he, and he starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pretty simple too. He always says, uh, I don't preach anything too fancy. <coughs> just Christ on the cross, Him crucified, you know. Here's this Jesus guy and He's perfect and you're not and you need Him. Amen? Let's pray. Like that was what he did. <coughs> 
So he starts preaching, and the people believed and they turned to God. And he calls the leaders of the church together and he teaches them how to, to live this thing out, to live out this new life with Christ as the cornerstone of your life, where everything you depend on Jesus, you rely on Jesus, you lean on Jesus, you're led by Jesus, you look at Jesus. Everything is about who? Jesus Christ, right? He's the cornerstone of our new existence. And it's obvious that the people followed Paul's instruction because he greets them at the beginning of the letter, if you remember that. He greets them at the beginning of the letter by referring to them as God's holy people who are faithful followers of Christ. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, Jesus Christ is actually talking to the church in Ephesus. And, he, and then they, kinda, they had kind of gotten sideways, but he brings them back. Thanks, brother. He brings them back to a moment, Jesus does, when he reminds them at the beginning. He says, hey, remember back at the beginning, like, I know you got off track, but remember back at the beginning when you loved me so much and you served me diligently and faithfully and you sought out truth and you chased the people that were lying right out of Dodge. That's, that's the church that Paul's writing to when he writes the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> and our subtitle for this message series, United in Christ, that tells the story of the entire letter that Paul wrote. When there's unity in the body of Christ, it functions properly. And the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. That is a Matthew 16, 8 church where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what a real church is. And there's no substitute for that. If it's not healthy, growing, and full of love, it ain't Jesus' church. That's what he's all about. And that's what we need to be all about. So just to bring you back a little bit, Chapters 1 and 2, we're talking about unity, right? Chapters 1 and 2, it talks about how there was Jews. That's God's chosen people. Na 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 na. And then there's the rest of y'all. That's what Jews and Gentiles mean. The, the, the world, the, the whole population of the earth is, is, is in two groups. There's either the Jews. <laughs> ah, you all want to be grafted in, right? Suckers. I'm, listen, I'm chosen and saved. Woo! Right? No, but seriously. There's Jews. And then, yeah, right. <laughs> there's Jews. And then there's Gentiles. The, the ones that aren't part of Israel. That weren't part of God's family. And so he's talking about in chapter 1 how there's this group and this group. But, listen, all of them are chosen. That was an amen spot. All of them have been adopted. All of them have been purchased. All of you, at the moment of your conversion, get the Holy Spirit. All of you were dead, but now you live. All of you were given grace, and nobody earned it. Nobody deserved it. No one can buy it. You don't deserve forgiveness, and you don't deserve to be adopted into God's family. Well, we're, so we're all the same, right? Yeah. Unity. Unity. Chapter 2, verse 16, I love this verse. <coughs> it says specifically that on the cross, Jesus created one body and he broke down, listen to this, and he killed, put to death hostility between people. That's what he did. Hostility was put to death, flatline. No life. Chapter 3 says that we are all loved equally and immeasurably. Chapter 4 reminds us that there is, you ready? One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is in us all. Amen. Chapter 4 also tells us that all of us, every single one of us, no matter how good you might think you are, all of us need to shed our old sinful nature and be led by someone other than yourself. He's the Holy Spirit of God. 
Chapter 5 still kind of pushing this, this whole idea of unity in the body of Christ. Uh, it starts promote, Paul starts promoting Christ-like relationships in marriage and in parenting. And then we talked about slavery. Slavery is illegal in this country. Praise God. Hallelujah. But we can, be, we can be slaves. I don't know. I, I'm reading this thing and I'm like, man, that's the workplace, you know. Because that's where a lot of these people were working. They were slaves at the workplace. But all of us, we may not be slaves, but we can be enslaved by things. Right? Because anything we choose to obey becomes our master. And so he says, focus yourself not on working for you, but focus myself working on him. I work for him. And so I'm, my, my chain of slavery is broken. And so in my relationships, I start looking at Jesus all the time. And he's my master. And he's who I work for. And he's who I worship. The rest of y'all, it, it's all good. You can't get to me. Right? <clears throat> if we pull this thing off, if we pull off this type of unity, there's great power present there. And that church will be dynamic. And that church will be influential. And that church will be effective in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that church is hated by the devil. That's the kind of church he hates. Where the gospel invades and hostility dies, there is peace there is love, there is compassion, and there is forgiveness. And the devil hates that church. He hates that church. In John 10.10, 10, I love this. It says here in the Bible that, that the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus' church is healthy, growing, and full of love. And the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and, and you know... One of, the, one of the devil's main tools of destruction is division. Division. And that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the first thing, the very first thing that Paul tells that church is let there be no division in the church. Let, no, let there be no division. That same Paul, he comes back in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3. <clears throat> he says, listen, there's no division. What's up, Robbie? There's no division. But listen, he says this, you have to make every effort to keep yourselves together, united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Look at that. You even gave me a little hauls. Oh, that was sweet. I wouldn't mind having one, but that thing... The whole time when I'm talking, you'd hear. No, I'm good. Thank you. We have to make every effort to keep ourselves together. United in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You know, I got to tell you something. There's a couple different camps in Christianity. Some people want to do everything without God. And some people think God's going to do everything without you. Well, I don't know here. You guys just make up your own mind here because you've got your own Bible and your own life and your own brain. But to me, when Paul says, make every effort, what does that mean? That means it's going to take some work, right? It's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's going to take a little effort to be bound together in the Spirit. It's not easy. And if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. You wouldn't see what you're seeing on television every single day now. And Paul wouldn't be teaching it. It's not happening in this world, but we have to see it in the church of Jesus Christ. And I want to offer you this. Can you drop the bass completely out of my microphone? Thank you. I want to offer you this. And do what you want with it. I think the Word of God is perfect and beautiful. But I'd like to offer you that it's not just work. It's a fight. It's a fight. And that's why when Paul finishes all that he teaches, 
in the first five chapters of the book of Ephesians, and I just summarized it for you, unity, 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 unity in this, unity in that, unity, 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 unity. He finishes it up where we're going to pick it up in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Now you tell me if you think it's a fight. Paul says, are you, are you guys there, Ephesians chapter 6? Okay. Don't cheat yourself. Put your eyes on God's word. Paul says, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, because, you know, in, in other words, he's saying, because of what I just shared with you, because of the truths that just came out of my mouth, that, that we need to be strong and we need to put on the armor and we're not fighting against, against people, we're fighting against these other things. Because of this truth that I just shared with you, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness... For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so you'll be fully prepared. <coughs> In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's war! It's war! It's not easy, okay? It's not easy at all. And I tell you that it's a fight because I believe the Scriptures tell us it's a fight. You look at the battle terms that are used in this short reading. Armor, fighting, enemies, mighty powers, battle, fiery arrows, and swords. It's war. It's war. But listen, before we venture into the armor of God and what it is, each piece, and how it works, and what it's for. I think it would be negligent if we didn't notice some obvious teaching that God has presented to us prior to the list. And the first thing is, is this thing's going to be rough. Like, you shouldn't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through. You shouldn't be surprised to see what's going on when you put the news on every single day. Like, it's awful what's going on. It's, it's awful how people are hating on each other, all different ethnicities and, and different religions and different countries, and we're fighting and killing and hating and screaming and riot and protest. Like, it's, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be rough. And that's why you see that, that God says here in His Word, He says, uh, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Like, this is not something to fight back the evil that's in this world. It's not something that you can kind of conjure up because you were undefeated in the playground when you were a kid and used to beat everybody up because you're tough or you're smart or you're creative. Like, you can't fight what's really fighting us. What's really fighting us is the second thing that God's teaching us. And the reason why you have to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power is because you're not fighting against people. You're fighting against all this evil stuff. Look, look, look what it says, verse, verse 12. We, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil. Let your imagination run wild. You ready? Against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenlies. We are not fighting against people. We are fighting against, against <coughs> darkness and demons and sin and the overseers of a dark and evil kingdom, not against people. 
And the time needs to come, and it needs to come now, that we as Christians let the world know that we don't hate any people. Okay? We don't hate people. We don't hate, it doesn't make any difference what your sin is. Whether it's a religious sin, because you're like literally bowing down to this drum and calling it God, that would be bad, right? That's bad. Do we hate that person? No. No! You gotta say no loud, loud and clear. No. What if I what if I kill someone? Would you hate me or would you hate what I do? But we don't hate murder. Who hates murderers here? You can't hate a murder. You can't hate any person. No matter what the sin is, we don't hate the people. And we're not fighting against someone who's Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist or this. Or it, that's not our fight. Our fight is not against other countries and other ethnicities and other groups of people. And we're constantly hating on each other, but that's not supposed to be like that in the church. <coughs> Paul even further separates people from the fray of this battle when he states in Romans 7:17, 7, he says, I am not the one doing wrong. Like when I sin, it's not me that's doing wrong. It's the sin in me that's doing it. Do you see how he's saying, he's saying listen, I, and, and, and all of us were made in the image of God. Every one of you. Every one of you were made in the image of God. You have beauty. You're a masterpiece in God's eye. He loves you. And He made you. And, and if you're made in the image of God, could you possibly be bad? Could you suck? In the, if you're made in the image of God, can you be bad? Can you be a, a, a bad... A, man, that's a bad apple. Throw him in the, in the bad cart. You're made in the image of God. Right? But there's this thing inside of us all. This sin nature that we're born with. That just acts out. It's just a rebellious child. And no matter how many times you tell it to stop. You know how many times I... Yesterday, oh my goodness gracious. We were here yesterday, working in this joint. And, and we had the kids with us. You know, I had the kids with me. It was early during the day because Meredith had to take Bailey over to, to get her physical for sports. And so I had Jackson, and I had Jameson, and I had Adriana. Oh, my goodness gracious. I don't know what it is about that stinking hallway back there, man. It's like a runway for planes. I told them, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I'm not even trying to make you laugh. I probably told them 20 times. Stop running. Don't run in the church. She probably can't hear me, so I'll talk about my kid. I, gr <laughs> I told them like 20 times not to run in that stinking hallway back there. And they did it again, so I grounded. This is crazy. What time was it? Maybe 11 o'clock? I grounded them to the couch for the rest of the day. Like, oh my goodness, there she is. <laughs> Get back there. I grounded her for the rest of the day, like till you sleep. That's, that's pretty strict, right? As we're getting ready to leave, I said, all right, we got to go. She goes, well, I can't find my shoes. I said, all right, I think they're back there. What did she do? Instantly. The second she got off the couch, she full speed right down the hallway. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? That's our sin nature. Now, how many times you beat it down and you spank it and ground him and right? That's why Paul said I have to beat my body into submission and make it do what I want it to do. It's our sin nature. The kingdom of darkness drove Adam and Eve to do wrong, and it still does. And that's our war. And you, the church, are called into that battle. And the, the church is the only place, I'm telling you right now, the church is the only place that has the ability to win this fight. Right. It will never happen politically. It will never happen eth ethnically. It will never happen by the races. It will never happen by politics. It will never happen by money. It has to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. It's the place where skin color does not divide, where wealth and poverty is not noticed, 
where young and old and both sexes are valued equally, where it doesn't matter if you're blue collar or white collar. These things that I just mentioned to you among a slew of many others, they, 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 they create sections and cliques and groups in our secular culture. And you see it on TV right now more than ever. And it's awful. <coughs> it's awful. But in the church, here's the good news. In the church, the thing that brings us together is not our skin color. It's not where our parents were born and raised. It's not our nationality. It's not our age. It's not our taste. It's not our region. It's not geography. It's not education. It's not ethnicity. It's not nothing. It's, it's Colossians chapter 3.11 where diversity is encouraged and that's all that matters is that Christ is in us all. Yeah. That's it, that's the only place in the world where that thing that has nothing to do with you brought you into a family. It had nothing to do with you. Everything to do with Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the only place it happens is in the church. The church is united in Christ. And all differences, they don't divide and separate us, but diversity comes together so that as Romans 15, 5 through 7 says, uh, may God who gives patience and encouragement, and we're going we're gonna to need that, right, to pull this thing off. Because we're very different. And we have different views and different perspectives and, and different priorities and different history and different traditions and different everything. And so we're going we're gonna to need some patience, amen? And we're going to need to be encouraged often by the Lord Himself. May God who gives patience and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God. Amen. That, that's what the church does. It doesn't say, well, you're wearing purple, so let's put you over there by the purple section, because purple lives matter. And, and, and look, I think you've got like a Harley Davidson shirt on, so let's put you over here in the biker section, because biker la uh, lives matter. All lives matter. All souls matter. And God, right now, tonight, right here, is giving you encouragement to accept one another and live in harmony so that black and white, young and old, male and female, Wherever you come from, Democrat, Republican, North, South, Jews, anything. Would you Ricans? We can come together in one voice. I heard you guys doing it a little bit ago. How many people heard the black people singing? No, you didn't. No, come on now. You were sitting right next to them. How many people, how many people heard the Italian voice? Speaking. How many people heard the Puerto Rico? Come on, guys, seriously, for real. Make a point. I'm making a point, and it's not a joke. Okay? It's not a joke. Did you hear Michael or did you hear an Italian? You heard Michael. That's enough. Okay? You heard a voice. And it doesn't make any difference what religion you were, what ethnicity you are, where you grew up, what your parents believed, nothing. All of us together harmonious, in one voice, yeah. praised God. You know why? Because none of us were thinking about ourselves at that moment. You were thinking about someone else, and it was Him. And that's where your eyes have to be all the time. And I, you put the television on, their eyes aren't on Jesus. Their eyes are on themselves. And we can't be like that, because we're the church of Jesus Christ, and we're different. And so the verse in, in, in Romans 15 goes on to say, that we can come together giving praise and glory to God with one voice. It says, therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. 
diversity and harmony and unity and accepting others that are different. That means none of us has the monopoly on the right way in all things. Nobody is spot on. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is Jesus Christ except Jesus Christ. And so accepting others becomes easier when you open to the fact that you may not be the single greatest expression of mankind. And the armor of God helps us to do that. And so when you look back in our text and look at verses 13 through 17 again, you see he lists off the armor of God. There's six of them. There's truth. There's righteousness. There's peace. There's faith. There's salvation. And there's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Six things. Just quickly going through them, the first thing is truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Amen. And the devil is known as a deceiver. And listen, church, you have to know the difference. You have to be discerning of the difference. Because both will speak to you. And you have to know the difference. Jesus is the truth. And that means that all of truth is somehow wrapped up in the person, work, and teaching of Jesus Christ alone. He is the, that's singular, He is the truth. He teaches us to love one another. He teaches us to forgive one another. And He teaches us to serve one another. And I would offer you this, and I think the text supports it, that truth is somehow the hub of the wheel and, and all the other five are the spokes that, that come out of truth. Can you visualize that? The reason why I believe that is because it's called the belt of truth. And the belt is, if you, if you could see a Roman soldier at the time when they got all their armor on, like the belt, it held it all together. Like without truth, you got nothing. I could get up here, and, or, or you could get the greatest speakers in all the world. You could get John Maxwell up here, and, and he could preach to you about leadership. and all. He could be the most dynamic, articulate, eloquent speaker, but if there's no truth in what he's saying, garbage. Right. Truth holds everything else together. And so I believe in this list that the truth is the hub that righteousness and peace and faith and salvation and the Word of God, they spin around it like spokes on a wheel. So with truth as our center and the, the rock that anchors us, we go on, the truth, let's talk about the truth of righteousness then. Well, the truth of righteousness is that none of us has righteousness. That the Bible says that your righteousness, no matter how good you really are, it's filthy rags in the eyes of God. You know, there was a group of religious people that put us all to shame in our Bible memorization and our religious activities. They, they had it spot on every single day. They were known as the Pharisees. These were the religious Jewish leaders in, in Jesus' time. They were, they were on it. They knew that Bible that you have in your hand that, that most of us ignore. Well, they didn't ignore it. They read it all the time. They had it like memorized. And Jesus said, beware, 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 beware of the, the yeast of the Pharisees. <coughs> Don't let them poison you. That, that if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, like if you're not more Christian, if you will follow me, than even the ones who are performing it perfectly, if it's not that, if it's not better than them, you got nothing. Now, how do you beat perfect? I have news for you. You can't. None of us can. You need Jesus' righteousness. When you said yes to Jesus, what you were doing is you were, you were approaching this perfect, sinless God and you said, you're dying on the cross. I'm going to give you all of my junk and you give me your perfection. And he willingly says yes. That's what happens at the cross. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus' 
Christ's righteousness that makes us all clean, if you will. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made this Jesus who knew no sin to become sin. Listen, he didn't just take on your punishment. He takes it to the next level. He became the sin that you committed. The one who never sinned ever in his life became sin so that we might in him become the righteousness of God. It, there's nothing that any of us can do to be good enough to have God's approval and go, okay, yep, heaven, you're part of the family, not good enough. You need Jesus Christ's righteousness. And only found in him that you might become not like super righteous or super better or super me or super man. It's to become the righteousness of God. Of God. So that's the truth about righteousness. How about peace? The truth, the truth of peace is that is not something you can create. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Get out there and, and, and influence the world. Make it peaceful, right? Well, you know you can't do that. I mean, the truth of it is that you can't do that. Romans 5.1 says that we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. So there's step one. That's a vertical expression of peace. That's between you and Him. You have peace with God. Like you don't have to fear Him that He's going to smite you and send you into hell or something crazy like movies might tell you if you've accepted what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You have peace between you and God. Now He's not some far off God that you're scared of. Now He's your daddy. And you can curl up on His lap and you can hang out with Him. Not to fear your father but to love Him. And so we, but, but, but is it something that you did? Well, the Scriptures are true. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. And in Ephesians 2.4, it says that Christ Himself has brought us peace when He united people into one body. When in His own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separates us. So this peace, this peace of God's armor of peace with God and with people from the good news, it takes our eyes and focus off of ourself and puts it back onto Christ. Peace with God and peace with people all are the work of Jesus Christ the Lord. Every bit of peace vertically with God is from what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. And every bit of peace we have with people horizontally is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So you see a pattern forming here. All these pieces of armor of God are not so much what I thought of, which is fight, fight, fight. They are, but what are they really doing? They're doing something. They're refocusing your mind. Let's talk about the truth of faith. The shield of faith to fight off the arrows of the enemy. Faith is just confidence to believe. Trusting in a God that you cannot see or touch. With your situations, with your circumstances, with your future. And the truth about faith is found in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. Where it says this. Don't think you are better than you are. But be honest, or some translations would say, be sober-minded in your thinking. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith that God gave you. See, when someone says, you, you don't have enough faith to be healed, tell them to leave you alone. Because you can't muster up more faith. Faith is something that God gives you. Okay? So if you, if you didn't get healed, it's not because you didn't have enough faith. Maybe God's timing wasn't that. Maybe, that's, maybe He's going for a deeper, greater healing in your life. Maybe your broken leg or your bad back or whatever it is that you've got. Maybe that's not what He's looking at. Maybe that's not the, the bullseye on the target. Maybe your heart is. Maybe there's a piece of your black, dark, Bitter heart that needs to be penetrated by the love of God before He'll fix your broken leg. Amen. 
I don't know what it is. But it's true. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourself by the faith that God had given you. Once again, the armor is a reminder that I haven't made it. That I'm not so super awesome. And if I have any awesome in me at all, it is Christ given, not mustered up on my own. John said that I must decrease as he increases. Stop thinking about me. Not thinking about me. How about putting on salvation as a helmet? What are, you, what are you protecting when you got a helmet on? Your mind, right? Protects your mind. Well, here's the truth about salvation once again. And it falls right in line with every other bit of armor that we've already gone over. Ephesians 2.9 says that salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done so that none of us can boast about it. No one can say, I got saved and Jesus loves me because of Anything other than he chose to. That's the, only, that's the only thing. That's the only answer. Anything other than Jesus saved me and loves me because he chose to, all the rest of the answers are wrong. Nothing you can do to be in God's good graces. It is not a reward for the good things that we have done. Romans 6.23 goes on and explains. He says, listen, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. So here again, God's armor protecting our mind from thinking about ourself and, and, and it shifts our focus once again to, to where God's word says we should focus and that is on Christ. On, listen, on Christ. Set your eyes on Christ. Fix your eyes and keep them fixed on Jesus Christ the Lord. No matter what day of the week, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the situation, no matter anything, where are your eyes supposed to be? On Jesus Christ the Lord. And the problem in our world is that our eyes, including the eyes in the church, including your pastor, they're not always on Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's where they need to be. That solves a lot of problems. Doesn't it? I've said this often. I'll say it again. That you'll never get your feelings hurt if you're not thinking about your feelings. If you're not thinking about your feelings, maybe you're thinking about Jesus. Someone ticks you off. You might not kill them. Just saying. I want to be practical around here, right? That's your lesson for the day. Here's the final one. The final spoke on the wheel of, of truth is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I love this one. This is my favorite one. Because I love the Bible. It's my favorite thing in all the world. John 1.1 1, 1 says of this Word that in the beginning was the Word. Does anyone know when the beginning was? I don't either. But in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Here's the confuser. And the Word was God. Don't ask. And the Word gave life to everything. And the Word put on skin and came down here and hung out with us. Can someone please tell me who that might be? Jesus Christ the Lord. That's the Word. And this same Word, Jesus, says Himself in John 5.39, you search the scriptures day and night looking for everlasting life and all the while they point to me. The Word. The Word. The Word. The Word. Jesus Christ the Lord. Eyes on Jesus. If you want to know the Father, look at the Son. He and the Father are one. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. The fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ the Lord. <coughs> so, <coughs> I 
<clears throat> if you want to know the Father, look at the Son. If you want to know how to live, look at the Son. Not the Son, the Son. S-O-N. Don't look at the Son. All of the armor, whether it's truth, righteousness, faith, peace, the Word of God, no matter what it is, every one of them are simply a reminder that we're all on a level playing field and that nobody is higher or better than anybody else and that no one is somehow lower or worse or less valued than anybody else. It's all of us united in Christ. Do you know what it means to be united in Christ? This is kind of a high theology and a tough one for a lot of people to stomach and understand and accept. But do you know that Jesus Christ said, I and the Father are one? So can you get that? Does that make sense to you? That Jesus Christ is, is God. He, he is the same as this unseen Father we've never seen, right? Well, it says in the Bible that we are one with Christ. And that when you said yes to Jesus, that He placed you in Christ at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now. Not some future time. Not that this life has to absolutely be horrible hell and finally someday I get to be with Jesus. No, you're with Jesus right now. Right now. You are united with Christ. Powered by Christ. Indwelled by Christ. In the body of Christ. You are one with Him. And we all have to understand that if we're going to exercise authority and power and have an influential and impacting ministry here in this community. All of us are united in Christ, fighting evil and pushing back darkness by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ the Lord. And the Bible tells us in Romans 12 too, to just allow God to change who you are by changing the way that you think. And that's exactly what this armor is really intended to do. To, to somehow transform the way we think by refocusing us on Jesus Christ the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do every single moment of every single day. And in this world right now, where you see all this absolute chaos all around us, in Orlando, and in Dallas, and in, and in and France, like, it's insane, crazy stuff going on. Like, every generation says, oh, well, we've got it the worst, and we've got it worse, and end times are coming. I, I, would, I would go to bat against any other generation. This is madness right now. People are hating each other and killing each other. It's rioting and madness, chaos across the earth. And there's only one group of people, there's only one group of people that can bring peace and love and harmony and unity to the world. And it's the, it's the church of Jesus Christ. It's us. And listen, the only way we're going to make a difference out there is if we can do it in here. If what we do in here can somehow permeate that world out there and they can see how all these different groups of people with different tastes and likes and, and, and different colored skin and different, different perspectives and priorities, whatever it is that, we're, that make us different. If, if somehow they can see us love one another, maybe they won't hate each other out there. But we need to stop identifying by groups that divide and start uniting around one person. Do you know who he is? It's Jesus Christ the Lord. Listen, he died on the cross for every single person. The ones you hate. The ones who are terrorists the ones who rape and kill 
He died for them. And he wants them saved, not dead. Paul the Apostle was the worst man ever. He killed you guys. And God saved him. And his words now preach to your heart and encourage you today to love greater. Amen? Amen. Let's be the church that God intended to be. A loving church, united in the Spirit, bound together in peace so the world might see something different. Amen? The worship team is going to come up and we're going to sing one more time. But before we do, I'd like to take a few moments and I want to pray with you about, a, about some, some certain things. And they won't, be, uh, they won't be lost on you. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about when we pray. I mentioned them just a moment ago. But I want to pray with you because it starts with that. Like, we, we may not meet every different ethnicity. We may not meet all these different people in our walk this week. But we can start by doing what the Bible says, and that is to pray for all people. So why don't, we, why don't we start with that? Why don't we start by praying right now together as a unified body of Christ. And we as, listen, one voice, right? With one voice can cry out to God because when, when God's people cry out to God, He hears their voice, amen? So let's, let's listen, if you've got some pain in your heart and sadness in your heart because you see what's going on in this world, Cry out to the Lord and beg Him and plead with Him to move upon these, this earth and bring peace and love. Lord, we thank You that You hear our voice. We thank You, Lord, that when we are broken and weak and sad, that You come in like a flood. You rush to Your family to help. That's who You are. Lord, we're praying not only for our church to be a united, harmonious group, but Lord, we're praying for our whole, our country. We're praying for our world. People are hurting. People are, are being sectioned off into different groups and causes hatred and resentment and bitterness between the groups. And Lord, you just love them all. I know it must break your heart see what you're seeing your masterpiece your people your greatest creation created and then you said it was good created to love one another to enjoy this beautiful planet that you gave us provided everything we needed a beautiful place to live and here we are stubborn children rebelling against you. Lord, you said that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their sin and pray to you that you would hear our voice and you would heal the land. So we as Christians, we are called by your name. We're asking you, Father, to bring healing to the land, to bring peace to your people, to bring love instead of bullets and death, to bring love instead of hate. Permeate the darkest hearts, Lord. Let there be a revival in your church, too. Wake up your church. Help us to spread your love throughout our communities and beyond. Help us to be partners with you, Lord, to, to build your church. The church that, that hell will not fight and win against, but that we will win. That we would see love cover a multitude of sin. That we would see compassion, a wave of compassion and forgiveness go across this land and across our world. Lord, we need you to shine like the days of old. We're asking, Lord, that you would do great things, mighty works for the world to see so people will run to you and find your love. Lord, start here with us. Help 
help us to love one another like you love us. Help us to serve one another like you serve us. Help us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. And Lord, help us to accept others as you have accepted us. Fill us with your spirit now. Fill us with your spirit now, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. We want to worship you. We want to worship you well. Not only with song, Lord, right now, but we want to worship you with our lives as we go out from this place. We want to worship you with our lives. We want to give our lives as a sacrifice unto you. But we need you to fill us with your spirit now so we can do just that. If you want to be filled with his spirit, just, just reach up. Just reach up. Say, Lord, fill me. Fill me. Just ask him. The word says that if those of us that are fathers, that are sinners, can give good gifts, how much more so will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Just ask. Fill me with your spirit. Use me as your soldier in this war against darkness. Help me not to hate anybody. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on you. In your name I pray.